the Seattle Antiquarian Book Fair. The date is October 10th, 2010. And I'm sitting here with a very old friend of mine who I've known for, as I was just calculating, 32 years. It's George Houlet, Antiquarian Bookseller from Los Angeles, who I waylaid on the floor here at the fair to uh, ask him to come to do this interview. George, thank you again for that. You're welcome, Taylor. Okay, good. And uh, yeah, we met at the Seattle Book Fair in 1978, in case he doesn't remember. Was that the first book fair? That was the very first one here. First and only. Uh, well, I was the first one and the only one in the Olympic Hotel. But, uh, did you exhibit that? Yes. You did. Was that the last time you did a Seattle Fair? Yes, it was. And that will remain the last time you I sold exactly one book, uh -huh. a Virginia well. Woolf book. And you probably sold it to a visiting dealer or something? No, to a woman who came back three or four times and looked at it. And, yeah, well. And no, that was it. Nobody ever said this was easy. So, no uh, dealer sales. Oh, gee. Memories, huh? Well, we're happy you came to visit anyway. Tell us uh, where you were born, uh, a little bit about your early life, where you went to school. No, I was born in upstate New York, near Albany, a place called Cabo's, which is where the... Uh, Mohawk and the Hudson River sort of come a confluence in an old area where they uh, used to have textile mills. Right. And my family had been there for a number of generations. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the uh, year I graduated from the eighth grade, whatever year that was, we came to uh, came west. My mother had uh, asthma, and uh -huh. uh, we needed a different climate, so we came to Prescott, Arizona. Oh for a year, and then after that to Riverside, California, where I went to high school, Ramona High School. I know that institution. Uh, after you graduated from high school, you went to the university somewhere? I went to uh, Riverside City College and spent a semester at uh, California Baptist College Interesting. and Loma Linda University, Seventh-day Adventist School, and then I went on to USC graduated from USC. Well, what did you get your degree in? Uh, I think it was history. History? Oh, wow. My uh, nice. major varied depending on the, the semester. So, well, that sounds like my, my uh, grades. At the, yeah. <laughs> I started in business. I wound up in sociology. And I think finally my uh, advisor said, you have enough units in history to graduate. So I Oh, good. <laughs> so I suddenly had a history major. So well, you, you were ready to graduate. That's yeah. nice. Uh, what sort of, did you have part-time jobs at this? I worked period? at University Library when mm -hmm. I was at USC, and mm -hmm. when I was at Riverside City College, I worked at the Riverside Public Library. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I was in the library at uh, Ramona High School, where I went to high school. So you had a background in libraries, although it's not a degree per se. No, I have a degree in, I have a library degree oh, from Western Michigan University, I see. Okay. 1967. I see. Uh, after SC, I worked for a period as a management trainee for the old S.H. Christ Company, the department store. Yes. And then I went uh, to work as a medical social intake worker for San Bernardino County and then went off to graduate school. So you did uh, kind of, was that part of your sociology degree? That uh, probably. It paid better than the Chris yeah. situation did. They really exploited you long hours and low pay, so... Uh, when I was able to work for the county, I took that job, which yeah. was depressing to a certain extent because you interviewed old people who were ill. Yeah, I, <laughs> you went to nursing homes and made sure that they qualified for these uh, programs of CalMed that they had at that time and other social made, programs. Make sure they were sick enough and suffering enough. And right. Oh, well, well, good. You're, you're feeling terrible. We're fine. You're signed up. And then I decided I wanted to go to library school, so I applied to all... 30 library schools that were accredited at that time and decided the first one that accepted me <laughs> I would go to and that happened to be Western Michigan. So you were a motivated uh, student right, at that right. point. So I went to uh, Western Michigan and uh, got my uh, MS degree there. And then did you return to California? I returned to California as uh, acquisitions librarian at Corona Public Library. Corona? Uh, Corona Public okay. Library. And then I transitioned from there to uh, as uh, assistant acquisition library at Cal Poly Pomona, uh -huh. and from there I wound up at the Beverly Hills Public Library as uh, audiovisual librarian, then acquisitions librarian, and then head of the reference.
Reference Department at Beverly Hills Public Library. And in the meantime, when I was at Beverly Hills Public Library, Jake Zaitlin somehow got me involved in doing uh, auction catalogs oh, really? for uh, Marvin Newman and the Ames Company. Mm -hmm. And that's how I sort of got into the auction uh, end of the business. And at that time, the Sotheby's was coming to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They quietly bought out the Newman Company, right. Marvin Newman, and I went. I did uh, a catalog for them, uh, having no idea of values, right. but I did a catalog of the Engelbar collection, which oh, was really? the first collection that they got in, Gee, and uh, the sale just exploded. I mean, my estimates were ridiculously low. Mm -hmm. Heritage was coming into the scene at that time, but the sale was very successful. What, what year was that, George? Uh, I think it was 72, but I'm around 72, I think, 71, 72. So your background to that point, you were able to handle these books and describe them, but without any... I, I, had no, I didn't know the values to any extent. With relatives. Uh, I, I'd been dealing in books since high school. Oh, okay. I had a company called Marcellus Books, and at that time there was no internet. Uh -huh, of course. And the libraries uh, had a lot of federal money at that time, and somehow I figured out that I could get books that were out of print here in England, mostly through Blackwell's. Through the, they used to issue a series of catalogs. So I was importing books from England and selling them to colleges and universities. Were those generally what we just referred to as out-of-print books? They or? were out-of-print in the United States, but they were in print in England. And some of them never been printed here, but the libraries at that time weren't aware that you could get these overseas. Right. So I. So they were happy to have you. They were happy the, to get them. And, the middle uh, right, and that's yeah. how I set up my little book business. That put me through college, actually. Wow. So you're yet another uh, bookseller who started out in their teens, right? Like, right. like I did, and Bud right. Plant, who's just right. in here, also started right. in his teens. Right. And I was selling books also at that time and doing scouting. Yeah. And luckily, just fell into some things. Yeah, that's a luck often. And the Mission Inn I went through one of its uh, bankruptcy periods. I stumbled across a good group of books there. Yeah. Well, after the single bar sale uh, went so well, better they, than anyone. They offered me a full-time job, and I left the library. Yeah. Right. At that time, I went to work for Sotheby's and did a number of sales for them. How long did you work for them? Not a couple years. I'm not sure the exact dates. But, uh, and at, then at that point, you decided to open your own uh, was the, Well, Sotheby's was having financial problems. They were on the verge of closing down, and... When the uh, Bennett and Marshall Library came up, we had a dispute over that because I worked hard to get that, mm -hmm. and they pulled it off from under me. They sent it to London, really? and I was very unhappy over that I and left, it, left okay. after that. Yeah. Michael Thompson just, uh, and Carol were just visiting with uh, George Allen. George Allen. Uh, apparently is yeah. still going strong. In fact, when I left uh, S uh, B Sotheby's, I went to work for Bennett and Marshall. Oh, for you did? Oh, okay. I and then I went off on my own. Now, what year would that have been? Probably 74, 75, wow. because okay. I opened my own store in 76. And that was on Westwood Boulevard, is that No, right? my first no. store was on uh, Melrose near Crescent Heights. I think it was 80, 64 Melrose. Oh. So I was there a year, a year and a half, or maybe a little longer than Roy Blyweiss, who had the store on Westwood Boulevard, decided to leave. Right. Oh, that. Oh, you had Roy's. Oh, I have. Nice. I okay. occupied Roy's store. You remember the address number there? That was. Mm, I'd have to look it up. Was it like the two thousand block of? Uh, well, it was between Olympic and Pico. Mm -hmm. That was when they called that the Book Row out right. there. There were many, many bookstores. Yeah, the Kermans had the Kermans. new bookfinders and uh, Carmio. Carmio was there. Uh, Science fiction guy uh, Barry, uh, Barry Levinson Le was Le there. Barry there Levin. was there was a French bookstore. There was a Spanish bookstore. Vagabond later came there. There was an archaeology firm. Woman too. dealing in Egyptian books. Can't remember who that was. Uh, Frank Spellman was there. That's, oh, I forgot. Frank he was occupied there. the uh, a little room behind my store. He always used to come in and use our restroom. Uh -oh. He had no restroom. And uh, that's for that. Uh, I have some stories. We will there. comment on no, that. We won't. And then for a short time, Gary Steigerwald opened oh the God. store back there. No, I didn't. He's kind of disappeared. I don't even know where he is anymore. He was in Indiana, New York. He, uh, he's up to. And then uh, at that time, the guy that 
now at the Lilly Library, worked for me, Joel Silver. Oh, oh really? He worked for oh, me God. for a period of time, and so did, of course, Phil Beavis. Yes, we remember him. Uh, wonderful delicatessen down the street there, Juniors. That's right. Had many a fine uh, lunch. I always like to get in the plug for Juniors. Valet parking, too. How long did you stay on Westwood? Uh, probably four or five years. Uh -huh. I don't remember. To the early 80s. To the early 80s. Yeah. I, I, at that point, realized if you wanted to stay in business, it'd be good to have your own building. Yeah. So you were in control. And the people that owned the building I was in kept saying they would sell it to me. But they would. I, got, I came to realize that they pro I wouldn't live long enough, probably. So I started looking around, and I found uh, 7260 Beverly Boulevard, which was empty at the time, and oddly enough, it previously housed a book operation. What was that? Uh, they sold books to libraries. Really? Oh, that was it called. Uh, I can't think of the name right off, but uh, uh, but anyway, they they had um, at, this was like a small Barnes and Noble or at the time they they wholesale books to the libraries and the people had died, the business had been liquidated and uh, the relatives were selling the building. So you were able to buy that building. I was able there. to buy the building. Yeah. That's nice. Now, remind me, that's... Western Library Service. Oh, I, okay. I, I know that. What was the name of the business that was there? During this period where you're getting established, working for the auction house through the library, and you were mentioning some of these other booksellers, were there any any booksellers in the area or others you had contact with that you would have looked on as sort of, maybe not a mentor exactly, but, you know, somebody that, you know, you could kind of look to for... Well, Al Cronfeld at Aldine Books was a big help. Really? I, I don't he had a that. store on uh, Vermont. Huh. Aldine Books. Aldine Books. I don't even Al know Kronfeld, that. and he'd been in business a long time. He helped me on a number of times. Oh, he was sort of a father surrogate in a way. Interesting. I'm sorry and, uh, I never knew him. You know, so. he, he sort of kept in the background, but he was a very good bookseller. Had a lot of contacts. When I first started visiting Los Angeles, there were a lot of old timers still in business. Charlie uh, Salzman. I was thinking of Charlie Salzman, Red at Baroque Books. Right. The ever popular Peggy Christian. Good word for everybody. Yeah. Well, when Peggy went out of business, I bought her. You bought her inventory. Bought her in really? inventory fixtures and uh, oh. actually took a lease on the building and later bought the building she was in there on oh, La Brea. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Have you hung on to that building? No, I sold it. Uh -huh. uh, I sold yeah. it. Uh, but uh, I kept it a couple of years. In fact, Al Cronfeld was running this another oh. store for me oh. over there. He had retired and mm -hmm. sold the store on Vermont, mm -hmm. and uh, so he was coming in and keeping that open. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you know uh, Maxwell Hunley? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Max was uh, in Beverly Hills, and then he uh, the building he was in got demolished or. And then he moved to uh, South uh, Pasadena mm -hmm. and was there for a couple of years, and his daughter took over the business. Right, I, I vaguely yeah, remember yeah. that. One. But uh, Max was a, an old time bookseller and sold to a lot of celebrities. He built a lot of the old fine libraries in Beverly Hills. And then there was, uh, of course, Cherokee Books. But before Cherokee was um, Harry, Harry Levinson. Yes, Harry. When did he come out to California? Very early. He, he'd been in a long time here. And Since the 30s. Right. Sometime. Yeah, he, yeah. He's sort of a contemporary of Jake. Yeah, I exactly. Did you, you mentioned Jake earlier, Jake Zaitlin, uh, one of the legendary people in right. the trade. Did you have much of a working relationship with him after you went on your own? Not really. Not really. Not yeah. really. But as I say, he got me into the auction and for whatever reason. Right. In fact, I asked him at the time why he didn't have one of his staff members do this. And he probably thought you could do it better. Well, I think he said he didn't want a conflict or something, or I don't know. But anyway, uh, uh, because before Sotheby's, I did maybe six catalogs for Newman auctions and then mm -hmm. Ames auctions and, yeah. and maybe a few other places just as a freelance basis. Do you ever recall uh, Harry Bierman of Pick a Book? Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you remember about Harry? Well, Harry used to go to Ames auctions all the time yes. and buy the libraries, and he sort of thought that was his fiefdom. He, he did seem to think he, that. In fact, uh, I got started uh, when I bought an art library uh, at uh, at uh, Ames auctions, and I think Harry resented that for a little bit. But anyway, and that's how I got started. I was dealing in art books. Some old library had turned up, and I bought the library. Uh, of art And that books. gave me an inventory to get started after I left Bennett Marshall. 
these days, I mean, you, you deal in a, a wide variety of things, but I would say that most people, when they think of a lot of the better stuff you deal in, it's uh, film-related, showbiz-related. Well, a lot. It's kind of a niche that we've discovered, sure, that the material's exactly. there, and, right. and uh, I've become knowledgeable in it. Yes, so it, uh, yes, you have. We've handled the, the Rosalind Russell Estate, uh, George Cougar's library, I which remember, was yeah. probably the best catalog I ever did. That was a beautiful catalog. And then... Um, some of Jack Benny's estate we got. Oh, I didn't know that. And uh, a number of others. And you had a connection with the Zane Gray estate, as I recall, yes, yeah. too. It's very interesting. Going material. back to the 70s, yeah. Right. 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 When I was at the Sotheby's, uh, one of the uh, ex-wives of uh, Romer Gray gave me some material to sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a call from Romer Gray when he found out about it saying the material had been stolen. So I contacted the uh, the woman that had brought the material to me, and she brought in her divorce papers, and that wasn't the case at all. <laughs> she had got this material as part of the divorce. So then when I contacted Romer, uh, he said, he turned out he really wanted to find out where she was. Oh, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> she didn't want him to know that. So, no. But then again, I he started giving me material to sell. Could get a movie script out right, of that too. Right. That's, that's and great. when I was at Bennett Marshall, he brought us a number of manuscripts, which yeah. later got yeah. sold to uh, to, to uh, Brigham Young. Oh my God, and, uh, what uh, you you've been in the trade uh, as long as as few people. I mean, it's hard to believe that somebody who entered the trade in the seventies is now considered an old timer. But I guess you and I would have to be fall into the old timer category. You've seen certainly a lot of things change over the years within the trade. What do you think might be one of the more encouraging changes in the trade in the last 30 years? Well, there's been interest in, for example, film material that didn't exist in the 60s and 70s. Yes. When, um, well, Sotheby's did that Paramount sale of all the props, and then I did the first Mon Marilyn Monroe sale ever. Oh, really? Uh, when was that? That was shortly after I went there. Uh, uh, the son of a trash collector had picked up this material behind the house of Marilyn's mother. Oh. And we did the first ever Marilyn sale. And uh, I started selling Hollywood material, sticking it in my sales, and that was unusual at that time, which it isn't today. Now they have sales of nothing but Hollywood material, but when I started doing it, it people sort of looked down at it. That, I'm trying to remember the year, the, the big MGM auction. Uh, as I recall, a lot of that material... I mean, 74, maybe. Like a, a lot of that material went for very little money. Very little. Yeah. It just, but then it's, the dollar was uh, worth more in those days than it is today, but there wasn't the interest in that material that there is today. You didn't have these big prices that... Uh, right some of that stuff brings today. So that's been a big change, and the interest in just autographs has increased a great deal, both you know, uh, vintage autographs, historical, as well as more recent material. What, do you deal in much recent material, I gather you don't? I don't. No. I don't deal in sports no. at all, I don't deal in aviation, I deal mostly in uh, pre-1960, but th sometimes other things come along, but a lot of the current material you can't trust. Of course. And the signatures are illegible anyway, so even if they're authentic, you can't tell what they are. Well, the, the sports, you can't, sports, those haven't been trustworthy for no, years. No, sports material can't be trusted. No, no. ever. I, no, I we deal do more vintage material. Yeah. Maybe half my business now is autographs. It's really? changed considerably. That would be letters, documents, right, photographs, right, right. Uh, and inscribed books. Inscribed books, material. and some memorabilia. Yeah. You know, we've, had, we've had that. We've sold Academy Awards. Really, we've sold uh, you know other memorabilia. People have to asked me a number of times about the the legality of selling Academy Awards. Can you just explain well, if they're before 1950, you can sell them. Starting in 1950, the recipients had to sign a document saying that the, they could not be sold except for a dollar back to the Academy. Uh -huh. But there's a catch in there. <laughs> you have people that got awards before 1950 and then got awards later. And when they got the later awards, they had to sign a document that covered the earlier. Early. So you have to be careful if you buy awards before 1950 to make sure they're not grandfathered in in those later documents. So somebody who won a lot of awards, you better be very careful. Check. Can you just give a few examples of some of the Academy Awards you've sold? Uh, we sold one for Boys Town. For Best Picture. 
screenwriter. Oh, oh screenwriter. There who, were who two screenwriters that? got, the, I don't remember the uh-huh. name. Two, there were two awards for screenwriting. It was shared by uh, two people, and uh-huh. we had one of them. That's nice. And yeah. Some of the others I can't talk about. Okay, that's <laughs> fair. That's fair. Uh, some of them get sold quietly, yeah, the ones well. after 1950. But yeah. you have to be very careful because the Academy is very litigious. Yes. And they, uh, but we've sold, we sold Paul Newman's, um, uh, not Academy Award, but his, um, the one with the globe, Golden Globe. Golden Globe, uh-huh. And there's no restriction on those. We've yes. sold uh, Sergeant Bilko's Emmy. Uh, he got more than one, I found out later, but we sold, we sold that. And uh, uh, some other interesting things. We were lucky to get a lot of good Disney material, uh, including his will, his social, his passport, and a lot of uh, documents relating to the formation of Disney and Disneyland and various enterprises. And we were able to get those because they were considered his personal property. They weren't part of the Disney Corporation. Disney Corporation. I so see. the family sold a number of those, and we were lucky to get them. But it's, it's interesting what you're saying is that a lot of this material, you have to be very careful as to who actually has title Right, to you it. have to be very careful. And with the Disney stuff, we checked with the corporation yeah, because that, we knew they'd, they'd, come, after they'd come after us. If, uh, <laughs> it, yeah. In fact, when I first saw it, I thought this must be out of Disney archives. Yeah. But it turned out that it wasn't. Okay. It's okay. Oh, that's, that's good. Uh, you have an open shop still? I'm, yes, yes, we uh, do. But we're, so we're more or less by appointment now, right. but if we're there, of course, right. we're there. But exactly. we're open uh, Wednesday through Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, close Monday and Tuesdays. We've done that for some time. And who all is on the staff now? How many folks? Uh, I have uh, three staff members besides myself. Now I know Bo, of course. Yeah, Bo and uh, Masa and uh-huh. uh, Toshi. Is, are you, you are you still sort of the shop manager? Or do you uh, defer that? To no, I, I still others? do the catalog and uh-huh. I still do the buy. Yeah, and, still uh, do the buy. You're still traveling a fair amount. For, uh, I'm doing more now than I used to. Yeah, I've noticed that. I yeah, like I'm doing that. more than I used to. You were here in Seattle about yeah, a year ago, right? So I'm doing more traveling than uh, going back to Boston. I'm not traveling as much overseas as I used to, but I, I'm doing more domestically. How would you describe, say, 20 years ago, you going on a scouting trip versus going on a scouting trip now? How would you uh, Well, it's, it's, it's more difficult, for one thing. You don't find the, uh, uh, the sleepers that you used to, so to speak. Part of it's because of the Internet. Uh, part of it's there's less material available, it seems like, and that, that's part of it. But the, the Internet's made a tremendous difference. I mean, we've been able to help customers build collections just because of the internet that you could never have done before the internet. That's another thing I was going to ask: yeah. is how, what kind of a impact, either beneficial or not, has the internet had on your business? Well, it's had a tremendous impact, and, and you have to go along with it because that's the way the course, flow is going. Yes. But it's uh, it's created opportunities you didn't have before. Exactly. Uh, we stopped doing printed catalogs just because we can reach millions of people. Right. And with printed catalogs, we're mailing a few thousand. So now we're selling material that we might not have been able to sell before. In fact, I know we couldn't sell it just because you're reaching people in parts of the world where there's an interest in a certain item. And uh, it, through catalogs, you couldn't reach them. You didn't have those people on your mailing list. And, uh, John Lang has pointed out that among many subject areas, high school and college yearbooks, which used to be very difficult to sell, now with the online... Uh, listings, you can find somebody to buy almost any of them. That's right. It's quite amazing. And there are people that specialize in them, nothing yes, else. That's but, right. Uh, yeah. But yearbooks. Yeah. No. I think it's been overdone, but yeah. uh, because you see prices on some that I think are ridiculous that's just because, yeah. you know, Ray Bradbury or Bukowski or someone's mentioned in a yearbook doesn't make it worth some of the prices that you see as no, for these things. If they have their picture and they've signed it, that's something That's else. a different thing. I've had Frances Farmer high school books that she signed, things like that. Uh, there are fewer open shops now, of course. Much, like, much fewer, yeah. Are, are you able to buy a lot of material via the internet? Uh, you, I, I am, but I'm very cautious yeah. because things aren't always what they seem no, to be. Not. And I try to get people to send things to me before I pay for them because we, for example, have bid on things that turned out to be nothing but a photocopy. Yeah, I, when I was first buying things on eBay, I yeah. misread descriptions. Or exactly. I, and I, I, I mean, some. Several photos of oh yeah, no. and some descriptions are so long that you miss 
the key word. One little line. Yeah. They, op- they, they just hide these things in the description. My uh, old friend Wayne Moy referred to that as stoning you to death with popcorn. There's just so much information you find that you just give up. And then you get a... But you, you really have to be careful. Yeah, the yeah just, absolutely. Um, yeah, a little off track. This is... You may be as specific or general as possible. Do you have a... Was there something in your uh, years in the trade that, like one particular incident or collection or contact or something like that, that you look back on, you just really have a great feeling about? Like it was just such a special thing to be part of, or a great deal you made, or something like that. Well, there have been a few. Yeah. It was the Bernheimer collection that I bought, and uh, uh, he was an old-time collector who had a, the best frost collection in the country. It sold through Park Burnett in the 50s, but he, he'd retained certain things. Mm-hmm. And a customer of mine uh, who wanted a finder's fee one time, and he turned me on to this guy. But I got a very nice group of books from him. And, uh, six or eight inscribed Oscar Wilde. It was a, quite a find. And at the time, he just set his price on them, which was extremely reasonable. Out of date, I'm sure. And uh, we bought some good film libraries that Maxwell Hunley put together. And even recently, you know, sometimes you get lucky. I was at an auction house not too long ago that handles books and handles other stuff, and the different department heads there sort of don't speak to each other because they're competing. And I went into the the movie sale was having, and there was a whole box of books on the floor. And they looked like they were mostly LECs, and uh, some of them were complete and some of them weren't. But there was um, a sleeper. Oh, good. (laughs) And uh, so you still find exciting things. Absolutely. This was that book that Doris Ullman illustrated about oh, the uh, Roll Jordan Roll. Roll Jordan oh, Roll, the signed limited well, edition too bad with the you. loose print. Oh dear, well. And my blood pressure shot up, ooh. and I thought all these other dealers are going to see this, and they uh, didn't. They didn't. Oh. I was able to buy the whole lot for about $800. Oh, bless their hearts. And that wasn't that long ago, and I thought to myself, this auction house should have spotted this. But, but Roll Jordan Roll looks just like a limited edition yes. the book in the slipcase. But there it was. I knew the book because I'd handled it a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, I've never had one. I had one in my hand one time, but it didn't yeah. belong to me. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, I mean, nice. we sold the book for like 18000 Yeah, Oh, I believe and it. And it would bring more today. But yeah, it was but, just yeah. the big mistake on the auction house. It was from the John Ford Library, oddly oh, enough. Goodness. These were all his books. Isn't that so? And uh, just, it just happened to be there. And I was sure other dealers had spotted it. But luckily, I couldn't believe when they didn't. Well, this is very instructive. So you can still find yeah. sleepers, but it's much tougher. It's not like the old days. But it can be done. Yeah, it can be done. It, it all depends on knowledge. And that would have been a great find 20 years ago. That's right. That's so, right. Well, the original copy of that that I had, I was work, when I was at USC, I was working for a bookstore that sold used magazines, of all things. And every day I used to take the owner's car and go to the Salvation Army and these other places where stuff came in. And that's where I got my first copy of Roll Jordan Roll. It did not have the slip case, but it did oh. have the extra print. Oh. And all the tissues were kind of sticking out of the book. Oh. But anyway, I was able to buy it. and uh, For what, a dollar or something? Uh, I think buy. she gave it to me, actually, when I asked her what she wanted. Poor fellow here. Is and then later sold it for, I think at that point, Dick Moore of International, International Book Finders book bought finders. it for, I think, $700. At that what a, time. What a great guy. The first LA book fair I did, he came by my booth, he bought a pen rod and a jacket, and I started to write it up and give him a discount. He said, I don't want a discount. No, you just get your price. I'm going to do fine. He was a great guy. And that was before the internet, and he was very good at the yeah. finding and selling things. Well, that certainly is a, is a uh, end of the business that has declined, is the search service. Right. Uh, now every person is his or her own They do their service. own searching, yeah. That's, right. that's completely declined. Do you anticipate keeping the shop open? And more specifically, do you have any plans to retire from the book trade? I don't know. I keep thinking I'm edging that way, but it doesn't seem to be going very fast. So. Well, Ken Carmel has been telling me that for 12 years, and he's edging to retirement. I don't see that either. So, uh, But for the foreseeable future, you're, you're still going to be there. You're hanging still. out. There's a doing, I hope, more traveling. Yeah, you know, you know, I'm trying to relax more and just yeah. take it easy. Well, next time you come to Seattle, don't make it during the fair. It'll be more relaxing. We'll have more fun. Okay? Okay. All right, George, thank you very much for sitting down for a chat. I appreciate it.
Okay, Taylor. Good. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye.